Hello and welcome to Money Reimagined. I'm Michael Casey. Today we're talking NFTs and the future of digital media and the arts. I want to start this episode with a personal reflection. I've been in journalism for three decades, which means I'm of the generation of journalists that started their careers with no real knowledge of what this internet thing was all about. Yes, dating myself, of course. Many of us greeted the internet with at first confusion, then wonder, then sometime later excitement over the possibilities of the so-called information superhighway. I profited somewhat. I made a career in the late 90s writing cautiously positive pieces about how web-based commerce would open up access to new industry players, disrupting everything from plastics to Wall Street. Looking back, I now know those predictions were right in some ways, but spectacularly wrong in others. Into the new millennium, we moved from that optimistic Web 1.0 era into the Web 2.0 age, one dominated by social media and a few large centralized platforms, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know who I'm talking about. Over the time, this new data and advertising driven internet became something of a curse for a lot of journalists. It forced many, many newspapers and other media outlets out of business. I was in two minds about this business fallout. I saw the fresh competition from news sites, blogs, and citizen journalists as an unavoidable, legitimate challenge to the mainstream media establishment. Of course, it was easier for me to say so as I worked for a large newspaper that was able to weather the storm. But even at the Wall Street Journal, we found ourselves scrambling to produce ever more content just to drive enough eyeballs to the site to generate the ads that ultimately paid our salaries. Articles, blog items, podcasts, and live digital TV. We were just relentlessly on a treadmill. I became aware that the real challenge to old media outlets was not meet new media outlets, but that publishers no longer controlled the distribution channels, which were now managed and manipulated by a few powerful Silicon Valley companies. We no longer owned our audience. They did. To paraphrase Bruce Schneier, we had become Facebook's product, not its customers. So it is with a mix of enthusiasm and trepidation that I've watched the rise of non-fungible tokens. Their promise to re-empower creators and publishers and challenge the silos of power are weighed against the reality that much of this so far has been about get-rich-quick speculation. There is real potential in this concept, but much still needs to be built of these new crypto models to help to transform media. Are NFTs about real change or are they just hot air and hype? How should journalists view this emerging industry with excitement and hope, disdain and citizen, cynicism, or something in the middle? What is the crypto media's responsibility? To address these pressing questions, we are joined by a journalist who is not only covering these new ideas, but is deliberately engaging with them. Kevin Roos, New York Times reporter, columnist, and podcaster. Kevin is the author of three books, most recently of Future Proof, which fittingly for a discussion about Web 3.0 versus Web 2.0 is all about the algorithms that run our lives. He became well known in crypto circles for very early on selling an NFT of one of his columns uh, with success that surprised everyone, including Kevin. But before we welcome him, let's say hello to my co-host, Sheila Warren. Hi, Sheila. Hey, Michael. So I'm just going to say I'm happy that for once uh, the journalists in this discussion are outnumbering the lawyers. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was inevitable. It had to happen at some point. You tried for, I remember you tried for Aussie parody at one point, but the reporter That's right. the I did get never really got in your favor. I get, well, I will consider myself the vocal minority for this episode today. A lot to learn about, starting with this distinction that I don't necessarily think about all that much about content creators versus distributors, which is really kind of core, I think, to the, the, the conversation we're going to have today with Kevin. Yeah, look, one of the things I think that's really also uh, important, I'm going to tap one of my own books here, the, the social organism that I wrote with Oliver Luckett, we talked about the distribution, not only did the distribution power move to those new companies, but the very notion of what constitutes distribution changed profoundly. It used to be all about physical things like, you know, uh, uh, cables and broadcast machines and, you know, delivery trucks that delivered newspapers. That's was That's what distribution was. But now it is a social network with all of the, problems that come with all of that like how many followers you have and how many likes you get that's literally distribution so the paradigm is completely different and it comes with it as we all know many many problems but um on that note it's actually a pretty good segue i think why don't we bring <laughs> kevin in kevin roos thanks for joining us thank you so much for having me so why don't we talk about future proof because i think that some of the stuff we were just talking about there you know, and I confess, haven't read the book, but I heard lots of great things about it. And, you know, certainly this idea of the algorithms that rule our lives 
is is pertinent to this idea right this distribution system is this sort of it's algorithmically driven behavior driven activity what did you seek to sort of say in that book and what are the lessons that you've learned from it in terms of how you go about viewing the world now as it, as it were sure well i'm happy to talk about the book some and then i want to talk to you guys about crypto because i have questions we'll for there. you too so we'll we can do mutual Already. interviews <laughs> um, so the book is um was written um over the last couple of years it's really a guide for human survival in the age of uh intelligent machines so uh, a few years ago i got really freaked out by all these sort of talks and books and prognosticators saying that, you know, automation and AI were going to take away millions of jobs, that we were all going to be unemployed, that robots were going to surpass us in every you know area of human achievement. Um, and I started getting sort of worried for myself professionally, but also for a lot of other people. And so I decided to go out in search of a plan, like what is our plan collectively as human beings for um, for sort of staying ahead, for becoming, you know, more resilient to technological change, for not being sort of made obsolete in the ways that people have feared. And um, what can we do on a personal level, as well as a collective level to become uh, future proof TM. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so the so book now is... we, a, we do have a lawyer in the room. After all. <laughs> I was going to say, well done. <laughs> Actually, I don't have the trademark on that because I also just I got invited the other day on a podcast uh, called Future Proof. So there are there are. Oh, there uh, and I also <laughs> saw when I was There's in the airport recently, the newest episode or the newest issue of the Harvard Business Review is called like the Future Proof Organization or something. So <laughs> I wish I had taken out some intellectual property rights, but uh, sadly, I did money, not. Money reimagined. I think like Capital One has got something. on that. <laughs> I think that's right. Banking reimagined. <laughs> Yeah, we, we do what we can. We know what we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yes. So yeah, so you, we are being future proofed. Uh, in you're, you're sort of helping us get ready for this this world uh, and 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 deal with it, right? Well, and I, I I started writing this book before I really got sort of uh, you know obsessed with crypto. So it's it's sort of my my attempt to puzzle through th some of these themes. Like, what does it mean that algorithms now make all kinds of decisions for us about you know what kind of music we listen to, what TV shows we watch, what, um, you know, in some cases, what clothes we wear, um, what brands of things we, you know, we surround ourselves with on Amazon and things like that. Um, and also more serious decisions, you know, who's eligible for government benefits, um, who's, you know, getting pulled over and stopped by police and um, that kind of thing. So um, this was my attempt to sort of take stock of the whole landscape of technological change. And to say that often, you know, automation and AI and technology in general disrupt our ways in life in disrupt our lives in ways that we don't see coming. Um, you know, when you know Microsoft Excel came out in the 1980s, no one said, "Well, this is going to obviate entire departments of humans whose jobs consist of entering data into spreadsheets and making pivot tables and all kinds of things like that." Um, you know, when when TurboTax arrived, no one said this is going to put you know hundreds of thousands of human tax preparers and accountants out of business. Um, and likewise with crypto today, I think there's a big uh, you know we don't talk about the automation angle, but a lot of what crypto is doing, especially in areas like DeFi is automating jobs that used to be done by humans. It is an automation story as well as a uh, you know technology story and a decentralization story. So those are some of the themes that I was exploring. Um, the book is, you know, it's it's sort of half um, I would say self-help um, in the sense, in, not in the pejorative <laughs> sense, but in the sense of literally self-help, trying to help myself um, puzzle through what my future looks like um, and also trying to you know, talk to the experts, report as deeply as I could, interview as many people as I could, and just get a sense of what's heading toward us. Well, it's certainly coming. Whatever's coming is coming at a faster and faster pace. I mean, the pace of acceleration here is unprecedented in human history, for sure. And it's interesting, I'll tell you, as a parent of young children, we try to think about what's the world we're preparing our kids for? We All we know is that we can't even imagine what it's going to be. Are we going to go from Web 3 to whatever Web 4 winds up being, right? So much faster than Web 2 to Web 3. So I'd love to hear a little about that progression in your mind, like this transition from web two into web three, I would argue we're kind of at like web 2.5, or a lot of these big platform players are now trying to enter the crypto space or uh, kind of try to um, adopt some of the web three, either terminology or approach to things, which I don't think is certainly at the heart of what we think about when we talk about web three, but curious to get your thoughts on that. Is web three really a thing in your mind? You know, is it something we should be preparing for future proofing ourselves for? Uh, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, I, I'm 
uh, really interested in Web3, both as kind of, you know, a technology story, but also kind of a, a psychology story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the people that I talked to have spent uh, a long time in the tech industry. You know, they're, they're tech industry veterans. They were there for, you know, 1.0. They were there for 2.0. They're, they're here for three. And a lot of what I see in them is kind of a, um, a sort of, you know, creative renaissance or they're that to them web three feels like the internet that they got excited about in the late 90s and early 2000s you know it feels new it feels fresh it feels like what the kids are doing um and so they are chasing that they're chasing not only you know money and 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 you know innovation and building big companies and the venture dollars pouring into the sector but they're chasing this feeling of optimism um, of, of thinking that technology is, is going to be ultimately a force for good because so many of the data points that we've gotten in the past you know five or six years suggest that there are big trade-offs that you know social media was not all good um, you know the web was not all good um, and so I think part of what's happening with web 3 that I've been really interested to observe is just kind of the way that it's sort of uh, you know redirecting some of that energy that you know, maybe some people don't feel like fixing the problems of web two. Maybe it's just easier to kind of wipe the slate clean and start over. And, um, and so that's been a really interesting thing to track. I, do I, do I feel like I'm the right person to prognosticate on which web three, you know, technology is going to be, uh, you know, widely adopted or not? I, I don't, but I think it's a fascinating, um, shift in kind of the, the, you know, sort of the, the culture of, tech um, of the Bay Area where I live, certainly I've seen people who have been pretty down on tech get really excited about Web3 all of a sudden. Um, so I think it is serving a psychological purpose as well as a technological one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I actually wrote a column about this last week, in fact, that, you know, the Web3, Web um, it actually has been with us for a while, Web3.0, of course, the way it was typically described and learned that it might have been Tim Berners-Lee who actually you know, coined the phrase that, of course, the Gavin invention. Wood. I think it was Gavin Wood. No, this is the. Oh, no. Sorry to correct. Oh, you mean way back in the way back in the day? Column. No, Gavin. From Gavin the early, put, early. Gavin yeah, is you're the not guy wrong. that branded it Web3. And he didn't, of course, put a real crypto angle on it, which made it very interesting. But yeah. But, but well before that, you know, 3.0. And the point I was really making, it was very much just, um, in opposition to web 2.0 right we didn't really know what web 3.0 just yeah. except that it wasn't web 2.0 right and and berners -Lee had his own vision for this thing called the semantic web which was a sort of ai driven different model for how we actually process information you know it didn't really eventuate um and and now there's this whole oh it's all about crypto but to me and i'd like to hear your thoughts kevin and maybe also yours sheila on this like to, to me the real problem of web 2.0 um, was the business model that emerged out of it, which inherently placed the interests of these ultimately big media companies that were really, as I said, distribution companies at loggerheads with, with society. Like there was just, there is a conflict between the idea of me secretly mining all of your data and using it to manipulate you, uh, you know, in the interests of society as consumers of the information that you are processing you know, to do so. That just seems to me that we've just, we built something in which, you know, media companies for all of their faults, you know, supposedly had an interest in getting to the truth and getting accuracy and, you know, it, and, and, um, and ultimately informing people, of course, there's all sorts of flaws in all of that, but it wasn't so stark as in my interest and yours are just actually misaligned. And that's, that's the way I personally feel about this. And I feel like that's to me, the hope, in some respects of crypto, wherever it goes, the idea of this version of Web3 is to actually sort of undermine that model and put power back into the hands of those who are actually producing the information rather than those who have the power to manipulate it. Um, that's my take. I don't know, Kevin, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, there's a lot in there that I, I think is is right. Um, one thing I, I think about a lot with crypto and NFTs and sort of the future of sort of uh, direct uh, relationships between you know people who make content um, and people who consume it um, is that you know it's a more direct relationship in some ways it's a more aligned relationship because you know like at the New York Times we're now a majority subscription business um, which in some ways gets us away from some of the issues that you mentioned about misalignment with you know advertising and social media platforms but it also creates 
you know, a new set of challenges, which is now you have these, this group of people who's paying you expecting a thing. And if they get that thing, they're happy. And if they don't get that thing, they're not happy. And so you, there's a danger of becoming sort of captive to um, an audience of either subscribers or people buying your NFTs or, you know, whatever is happening in the creative market. Um, there is no perfect solution. Ad-based solutions have their uh, drawbacks, but so do direct relationships and subscription businesses. So um, that's one thing that I, I, I think of. I'm not sort of nostalgic for the, you know, the golden age of, of newspapers or anything like that. Um, but I do think that, you know, what we had for a time was a kind of, uh, you know, best of all worlds scenario where you had, uh, you know, advertising that was supporting a mass media, but you also had, um, you know, subscription revenue that would sort of blunt you from the, 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 you know, that would blunt sort of the worst effects of the advertising sort of click driven business model. Um, and so I, yeah, I think the, the future is going to be a mix of both. It's going to be some ads, it's going to be some subscriptions and direct relationships like NFTs. I don't think we can ever fully shift away from an ad based uh, media model. And what I think is really interesting is even beyond the business model behind it, it's kind of this fundamental question, which gets you, you can go down the rabbit hole of section 230 and other things like who gets to say what and where, which I think is fundamentally what we're talking about. Because in kind of what I think about from a layperson standpoint, the golden age of, of media as it's described, right, where you had a newspaper fully controlling the content that was being released, you had reporters that certainly had bylines, they had their, they were, they, they knew, uh, they were known to people, but not in the same way that kind of like the big I remember growing up and seeing, you know, Dan Rather and these kinds of folks like on the news and they were sort of controlling the messaging around what we heard as a country, right? But what what also the world was hearing about what America was telling itself, which is really powerful. And you think about that control being held by a handful of older white gentlemen, right? And that was the same thing was true, I think, in newsrooms. And so then you kind of, there was a, I think there was part of it was resistance and backlash against that to say, we need other voices. We need a more democratized way to access content and not just content, but points of view, because of course, news report and reporting as objective as it tries to be comes with its own slant on things. And we see that and that's become more pronounced as time has gone on. So then you had this kind of desire to sort of give everyone the opportunity to create content and have like the internet itself, right? Like democratically decide like which content is more valuable. How do you become an influence? All that kind of thing. Then we've seen that model taken to the extreme where, well, it's problematic again, because now you yet again see people that have the time to post constantly or to make the TikTok video that's fancy or the whatever it is, are now the ones who are controlling some of our societal narrative, which is differently problematic in a different way than it was in the kind of web one model. So I think, or even in the pre-web model. And so I think that when I think about all of this, it isn't even so much about the ad or subscription or whatnot. It's like, how do you get enough followers or, or awareness of who you are in a saturated environment to even create a subscription model that could be financially remunerative enough for you to actually survive off of that, right? And keep creating that content. And as we get more and more people entering the workforce who think about this as the primary way that they digest news or content or media, it gets even more crazy. So I see some of that already being replicated in NFTs the idea that like the cooler you can make it or whatever it might be, you get more of this, the more exclusive it can feel. And so I'd be curious, Kevin, to kind of hear about, because you dove right into this, curious to hear about your NFT experience. And if you, did you come up against some of these, whether models or, or the exclusivity of the whole thing, or, or how did that all play out in your mind? And also it's just as a general matter, like talk us to the story, like what made you decide to release an NFT in the first place? I'd love to hear that part too. Sure. Um, well, it was sort of a, a long process, but I, I got interested in NFTs sort of earlier um, in 2021. I think the, the Beeple sale had just happened, um, you know, the $69 million sort of Sotheby's sale, or was it Christie's? I forget. One of the big auction houses sold, you know, some of Beeple's art for $69 million and everyone sort of stood up straight in their chairs and said, Ex excuse me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I remember seeing that and thinking, well, this is fascinating. And I want to find a way to both explain um, what is going on to our readers, um, because that's an important part of my job, and to figure out for myself, like, what are the promises and, you know, maybe pitfalls of this new, you know, technology. So I uh, came up with the idea that I would write a column sort of explaining NFTs and the whole phenomenon and what they were and why people were interested in them, and then mint that column as an NFT and put it up for auction. And uh, this was sort of like a stunt, I, I admit. Um, and I 
you know, told my editors that I wanted to do this and they they said, excuse me, can you start at the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> and I had just, I will let you guess at the number of meetings that I had um, in preparation for this. And the lawyers when, got involved, I'm sure. I'm something. sure. <laughs> Whatever number you're thinking of for meetings, it's higher than that. And, um, and so eventually I get the sign off. Uh, you know, they say you can do this. The proceeds will go to charity that the New York Times has its own charity called the Neediest Cases Fund. And so we said, you know, any proceeds we make go to there. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, well, this is all moot because no one's going to buy this thing because who the hell wants a, you know, JPEG of a newspaper column that they can read for free on the internet. So, um, you know, in Slack, there's some great uh, records of, uh, you know, my colleagues just like absolutely dunking on me for <laughs> thinking that this was going to get they're like, you think someone is going to buy your, yes. you know, piece of crap column <laughs> or, you know, I, I remember I set the reserve price at like half an ETH, which at the time I think was like, you know, 800 bucks or something. And, um, and they were like, you think someone's going to pay $800? Come on. Like, who do you think you are? So they're taking bets on how little it's going to go for. And the auction, um, you know, goes up and for a while there's nothing. And, you know, some people start, you know, bidding like, you know, the, the minimum, and, um, and then, you know, the next day I wake up and there's like been this total bidding war and, um, you know, it's gone up, you know, from, you know, uh, 10 ETH to, uh, you know, 50 ETH to 100 ETH. So finally it closes out at uh, 350 ETH is the final sale price, which at the time was about $560,000. And today I think I checked it, it's about a million dollars. Wow. So, um, so I had, uh, you know, all of a sudden I had like 350 ETH uh, just sitting in my wallet and, um, and had to figure out what to do with it, which was another whole process. But, um, but it basically it was a way for me to kind of experiment and write about the experiment. And, um, and that's always been a kind of journalism that I really enjoy is just jumping in and, um, and talking about it from the first person perspective. So that was a real wake up call for me. And that sort of sent me, um, you know, down the rabbit hole as it were um, on crypto and NFTs and web three, and just started me like kind of becoming obsessed with and learning as much as I could about them. I mean, I, I listened to your, uh, another podcast, the New York times post, the daily had you on to talk about this. And what I really liked about it was the conversation that you had from there thinking about, okay, what did this person buy? Like, what is the actual value of spending, you know, what was then $550,000 on, on this thing, which as you point out, you can quite easily read on the internet, it's a JPEG. It really doesn't have any utility in that regard. And I think you came down in an area that I tend to agree with you on, which is that there's this something about bragging rights and, and, and the firstness of things and the ability to have that certificate of being that one and the collectability of all of that. And, and much of our economy does depend upon that sort of stuff, right? So I don't know, just maybe break that down a bit further because you've obviously given it some thought. You're like, why on earth? Like you were literally, you know, the recipient of, of, of that, that sort of mindset or whatever it was that was driving the urge for somebody to spend that much money. Yeah, I did. I, I went back to a lot of the bidders in the auction. I just sort of called them up and asked them, like, "Why did you do this? Why? What was? What was? What was? Well, what got into you?" I know um, this is awesome, but why did you think this was right, awesome? <laughs> right. Um, and so the answers I got ranged. I mean, some people said, you know, basically like this was, you know, I, I considered this a marketing expense for my crypto startup or my art project or whatever. Um, if I could get mentioned in the New York Times, that would be worth whatever I paid for it. Um, but at the high end, the people who actually sort of, you know, won. The, the bid and we're sort of bidding, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, of ETH for this NFT. You're right. It was more about sort of bragging rights. It was being the first, it was having a potentially, you know, historically important NFT, the first, you know, New York times NFT, might, you know, they thought might be worth something someday. Um, and I always find this criticism of NFTs really strange. Like there's always this knock. Well, it's, it's just showing off. It's just mm -hmm. bragging rights. It's just, people seeking to display their status or their wealth or whatever with their crypto punk or their board ape or whatever. And like, I always go back to this like question of like, well, how much of the economy runs on rich people showing off? Um, and it's actually a surprising amount. Um, the third richest man in the world is a man named Bernard Arnault. He's right after Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, the third richest man in the world. And he's the chairman of the Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy company, LVMH, uh, a company that is, for all intents and purposes, exclusively selling rich people status objects, uh, you know, fancy handbags, uh, you know, 
designer liquor, um, all kinds of, you know, fancy products that normal people can't buy, but that rich people love to buy to show off their status in part. So a huge part of the economy runs on this. And so even if that's all NFTs were, and I don't think that's all they are, but even if you take the case that that's all they are, that's still enormous. I mean, that's a, that's a huge part of the economy. And I think we need to pay attention when people, you know, when rich people start signaling their status in a new way, even if we don't totally understand it at first. And then I, there's a, you know, there's a sneaker industry and a luxury bag industry that would absolutely support everything you're saying. I'm in this group, Facebook group, funnily enough, of lawyer moms, and there's periodically conversations about how do you get some of these items? And there's this whole conversation that happens like, why do you need that thing that costs $30,000? Or, you know, how do you, how, and it's, it's, it's hilarious, some of the flexing that happens, but also just some of the very, very wealthy people who are like, oh, this is just something that I take for granted. And it's a way for me to kind of enjoy this thing, but also kind of demonstrate that I have certain status. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right in that. And I think it's kind of an interesting question. We, we talk a lot in the show, like, where does culture start? You know, what part of the culture actually creates things? And there's a lot, I, I've been really fascinated in following the, the Black creators who are making NFTs and collectibles and kind of the way that that culture, which oftentimes is where a lot of music, like a lot of sports, a lot of things start with that community are kind of bleeding over into kind of mainstream or more um, are getting normalized in ways that are really kind of really broad spread and, and, and societal. So I've often said on this show, like I'm just waiting for Bollywood to pick up NFTs and really start running <laughs> with it because that's going to, and then Korean in pop culture, right? That's going to be- Oh, once, once the K-pop people start doing yeah, it, it's just, over. Oh, like oh. they they run the internet. <laughs> that's right. And, uh, that's and if right. the BTS army decides that NFTs are cool, like it's over. Well, they did actually decide right. that it wasn't. The BTS army did say they were going to launch one. They got a backlash from their fans, but I think they're still moving ahead with it. There is Oh, well then it's dead. I mean, you can't overcome <laughs> K-pop <laughs> resistance. That's like the, the final boss of internet movements. <laughs> yeah, but I think there is so much about this that is about culture and it is about, you know, what we what different pockets of our society value and so there's the luxury goods market there's also like you say hip-hop culture right no joke i mean there's a lot of power that comes from that community um there's definitely the lgbt community and a lot of things that they've created that kind of make their way to television to, to media uh that then become popularized so i think all of that is really true but i also think with nfts there is this idea that they can contain a proxy for rights for access rights so it's not just this, this is what i find fascinating this is the lawyer hat that i'm wearing here so it's not just a uh, status or the owning of a cool thing or whatever it might be or the flexing. It's also that that can then translate into actual concrete rights. So we saw this, Michael and I, we talked about this a little bit with the um, the, the NFT event, I'm going to call it a conference, the NFT conflagration that happened in New York, where to get into the board Ape bar or whatever it was, you had to demonstrate that you owned a board Ape. It just happened all over the place, all kinds of different NFTs, but they were literally the, the passport to get into these places. And I think as things like vaccine records and all that, you get used to kind of showing a thing to get into a place, which is not something we ever really did before, apart from your age at a bar. I think we're going to see more and more of this concept that what does an NFT translate to in terms of rights? This is even more compounded when you think about the metaverse. So if you're running around the metaverse and then you hit a wall, that wall, the, the access to that, whatever that room is, whatever that part of the metaverse is, is probably going to be dependent on some kind of record, which is most likely going to be an NFT. So all of this, I think, when you when you look at it in the context of property ownership, legal rights, what actually is it that you're owning intellectual property wise is somewhat secondary to the access it's going to give you not only to flex, but to be around people that similarly value that same thing. Totally. So, yeah. So so let's let's transition a little bit into the metaverse, which certainly is something that I don't know that everyone makes all these connections to Web3 and the metaverse. And some people think these are terms of the same thing. I think they're a little bit different. I think of the metaverse as kind of um, digital property, like digital. There's this whole there's this hilarious thing I saw that I can't remember where I saw it. It came down that like someone's creating something called Crypto Land. Have you, have you ever heard about this? Crypto Land. There was this like big piece that came out probably on medium i'm not quite sure i'll try to dig it up but basically it was like there's going to be this place called crypto land and getting in is going to cost this amount of money which is an absurd amount of money it feels a little fire festival to me to be honest but then there's this whole question i was in the ft that 
it, what does that mean? There's going to be bars, there's going to be uh, salons, there's going to be private islands within crypto land, right, to get into. And so when you think about the metaverse, is that the use case that you imagine? Or are you thinking more of like the gaming environment that everyone's more familiar with, where you're kind of moving around, collecting things, having battles and whatnot? And how do you see gaming connecting into this entire conversation around Web3? Let me land the question there for you. Wow. Um, that's a great question. I also would really love to go to crypto land for a story. So if any, uh, if anyone wants to send me to the South Pacific to uh, hang out in crypto land for a while, if any editors of mine are listening. Um, Safer love... than going to, you know, to Baghdad in the US. Exactly. I mean, you're exactly. Right. Yeah. You. What could possibly go wrong? Exactly. Although I say that now and then, you know, I'm the guy at Fire Festival who's like eating ham sandwiches in this, you know, in the, in the FEMA tent. Um, so I think about the metaverse as being less about sort of a set of technologies and more about sort of the merger of our online and offline selves. Um, and I think that this is already happening to some extent. I, you know, I, I, um, I, I, uh, you know, went on vacation once to a, a resort um, and it happened to be the same week that a bunch of like Instagram influencers had been invited to like stay at this resort and take a bunch of pictures and do free marketing. And, you know, they were getting these comped stays at the resort. And it struck me as like a really interesting uh, moment of like the culture that these people or the, the capital that these people had accumulated on social media, all these followers, these reputations were sort of allowing them to do things just to your point about access, like in the physical world, um, that, uh, that they wouldn't have been able to without those, those credentials. But I think that, you know, the metaverse is sort of a state of mind. Like we all, um, we all have online selves and offline selves. And I think as those online selves become more um, sort of more forward in our conception of who we are, um, become a bigger part of our identity. I think that that's, that, you know, that's moving to the metaverse, whatever, to me at least. Um, and so, you know, when you have, I think during COVID, especially a lot of people's primary experience of the outside world and of other people has been mediated, you know, through screens and through internet platforms. Certainly when I see, you know, kids, preteens, like spending all day in Minecraft and Roblox, like that to me feels mm -hmm. like they've moved to the metaverse and yeah. they would actually rather have like a cool thing in Minecraft than like a cool item in their bedroom um, because they spend more of their time in Minecraft. So mm -hmm. to me, it's like, where do we, where do we become primarily our online selves um, and that tipping point to me feels like that's where you yeah. like enter the metaverse that's the fascinating way to put it because it is to Sheila's point about culture as well right so yeah. culture is not a it, it is an inherently intangible thing and it can reside presumably anywhere um, and its value uh, is expressed in all of these intangible ways and so it is the sort of thing that you can um, you know to, to this idea about the bragging rights and the showing off rights right that I can do in a metaverse environment it's not the place I can sit at a bar and enjoy a martini, right? <laughs> but I can, you know, I can do all of that other sort of ancillary beneficial stuff that is so much a part of the way, as you, as you quite beautifully put it, the economy runs on rich people showing things off, right? You can do that in the digital realm. So I, I think that's a really important, important point. I mean, one of the things that I find, and I just, both of you maybe weigh in on this, but I, I'm excited about NFTs for what I've, I see them as the building blocks of property rights. They are, Sheila, you talked about being a proxy for property rights. I think in a purely on-chain environment, you could say that because they right of access, yeah. they give that. But like once we start trying to translate external aspects of this, and I have to be careful because a company that I helped found is working on what we think is the right solution to this problem. But the, you know, this drawing the link between the real world and this NFT world, this still needs to be a lot of legal can, can construct Absolutely. around what those rights you are. Still need you, <laughs> you still need lawyers. <laughs> you still need lawyers. You still need lawyers. And they're going to have to come up with very clear ways to tie those NFTs to those usage rights. And so that if I do get exclusive rights to Kevin Roos's column, and there's a way for me to take it down, I'm able to actually execute that. And we don't have that right now. But when we get there, it is a, NFTs, I think, are the building block for this. And, and that's really, really important because property rights, the right to, you know, and it's about right of control. And what, it's not just about ownership. It's really just as much about what can I do with this thing that I have exactly. this right to? Um, is the building block, it, it, you know, whether we like it or not, right? It, you know, we sit on the left, right divide on these issues. It, it's been there at every moment in history when there's been these leaps. So the Magna Carta was the moment when, you know, the aristocrats, you know, yep. basically told the king that they weren't going to take it anymore and they were going to stand up for their rights as noblemen. 
you know, it's it's there at the sort of the dawn of of uh, the, the the stock the stock market with the with the VOA and the the uh, the Dutch East India Company and the arrival of stock rights. It's there when Deng Xiaoping uh, basically kicks off the Chinese growth story by giving property rights to to homeowners okay. within the Chinese population. So, and, and, you know, this is um th th this is an under De Soto's big thesis about the mystery of capital that it comes from the ability to actually express and then work on those rights and execute upon them. And he was always talking about mortgages and things like that as being a form of that. We have had no means to do so in the digital realm because there was no such thing as digital scarcity. I could just repeat anything. There was no capacity to say, this is a unique digital artifact. And now there is. And so the idea that this, this thing, the digital economy, which was already such a huge part of our lives, could now have a building block upon which to exert that same powerful mechanism that history has shown to me is, is really, really important. But, um, you know, when we think about that, right, some of these land grabs that are happening, you know, whether it is buying the land next to Snoop Dogg's metaverse home, right, because you think you're going to benefit, right? I, 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 I wonder whether this is, this is akin to, you know, the arrival into the new world uh, of, of you know, the conquistadors coming in and claiming all these huge tracts of land for themselves so that in the future they sit there as the big landed gentry. Um, and, and, I, and I suppose if that is the case, it, you know, should, can we control that? Should we control that? Like, you know, is there some means, should we be thinking about who's going to actually control the future of the first adopters are going to be in there grabbing that? Or is the pure like abundance of the digital space make this whole point moot? I mean, I, yeah, I, uh, well, Sheila, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it too, but I, you, you know, I, I, I think this is one of the thornier long-term issues for crypto and web three, which is that, you know, right now we have sort of the internet is kind of the exception to uh, a lot of sort of societal rules about capital ownership and rights. And it's sort of this like place where, um, you know, any, teenager in Delhi can speak with the same authority and the same, you know, tools as, you know, a very wealthy American CEO. It's sort of a, a level playing field in that way. And I don't want to idealize it and, you know, say that there's nothing wrong with it, but it does have this quality of the internet of being um, sort of free of some of the scarcity um, that defines the offline world. And so when I hear people talking about, you know, property rights in the metaverse and, you know, how do we, uh, you know, ensure that only desirable people, you know, move into our metaverse neighborhood. It's, it has some really ugly historical echoes to me. And, um, and I don't think we, we should feel like this is going to be entirely a good thing that the internet in some ways, if, if the web three, you know, folks are right, is becoming more like the offline world in the sense of being exclusive, in the sense of being, you know, gate kept um, in, in the ways that our physical world has been for so long. So that's the other side of this. I, I totally see your point about sort of figuring out a way to transition our understandings of property rights to digital spaces. Um, but I do think that, you know, the potential downside is that a lot of people who enjoyed access to um, spaces and, you know, social capital and things like that on the, you know, in web two um, could find themselves locked out in web three. So, so I want to just like um, just close this out. Maybe one just went one last question here, Kevin. And it's it's funny, like when I think we 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 caught up in a bar, Decrypt Media was sponsoring an event, and you came by, and there were people before you arrived saying, "Oh my God, Kevin Roos is coming because apparently he's going to be writing this big piece about crypto media." And they're all like, "You know, what's he going to say?" And and we have a chat at that point. I'm not sure if you ever wrote that piece. I certainly didn't see it, but I'm 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 really keen to just like drill down a little bit into now that you've gone down the rabbit hole you sort of look at us i'm in a different position from you i cover crypto as a kind of a crypto native although like you i come from my roots are in mainstream journalism um you're now in that mainstream establishment but very much getting yourself steeped in it and looking at it from that perspective um what do you see as is the responsibilities uh for for we journalists in this space right particularly as we explore what we were just talking about these these big societal questions about who gets to say and who gets not to say what this future looks like um and i'm just going to highlight a piece that i i read this i think shared it with you this this uh um gideon Lick, lickfield um the new editor-in-chief of wired wrote this piece about what you know the new the new wired is in a way is going to be and wired was this publication 
the beginning of the 90s that I was always drawn to as really important because it was the first in my mind, first news outlet to recognize the internet was not just a bunch of wires and modems and computers. It literally was this, this glue that would form this new social experience and that it was going to transform everything. And they did really well, but he pointed out that it was kind of like this Bible of techno optimism and, and that ultimately we've come to learn that technology can have all these negative impacts as well. And so the question is like, should we be cynical, skeptical? Should we be sort of positive and tech? Or is there some sort of, what is the role of the journalist in this very fast moving environment? Um, is it different from, from what it traditionally has been? I suppose would be one way to put it or not, but really what do you see as our responsibilities as um, you know, what we traditionally used to call the fourth estate in this, in this environment? And before you respond to that, Kevin, I actually want to respond to something you were saying earlier and, and take your invitation to comment, which is, uh, this is exactly what keeps me up at night is what you're talking about. The idea that we, we, I think we are naive if we imagine that we are not going to wind up replicating certain parts of exclusionary behavior that exist in a non-internet, you know, real world society within anything, that, whatever you want to call it, the metaverse, online environments, you already see this. I mean, you go into you know, the average DAO that's not well moderated, frankly, and you see a lot of nonsense happening. And sometimes that's overt um, racism or overt harassment. Sometimes it's character assassination, you know, and, and it's, it's, I don't know, it kind of goes back to your sort of fundamental philosophical take on human behavior. Do you believe that we're going to wind up in like a yellow jackets, Lord of the Flies, you know, <laughs> environment? Or do you think that people are going to self-regulate and self-govern and treat each other with respect? Um, you know, I, depending on the day, my view on that goes back and forth. But I, what I am hoping is that we have a chance now to incentivize behavior that really is more democratic and to create opportunities within, again, whatever you want to call it, the metaverse or in these more uh, fundamentally democratic technologies these technologies that really are um, predicated upon the idea that you can empower any individual to serve a meaningful role, regardless of their status in the outside or, you know, real, quote unquote, real world. Um, and if that's the case, it's about, I think, cementing some of those incentives. And that can happen in a variety of ways, including one way, which I think is regulation, which I think is underrated. So just wanted to land that point, but then very eager to hear your thoughts on the role of tech journalists within all of that. It's a really good a topic of conversation and one that I'm sure we could, you know, spend eight or nine hours on easily. But I, I do worry about this too. It doesn't keep me up at night. There's plenty of other stuff that keeps me up at night, but it uh, it is something that I think, you know, the, the Web3 community needs to contend with early on because that's the time to shape these systems is when they're young um, and before the problems get baked in and intractable um, as, as we saw happen with social media. I think that the role of uh, journalism with any industry, not just crypto. I think there are sort of categories of journalism. I don't think you can say that the journalist job is X because within journalism, there are um, trade journalists. There are people who, you know, in the aeronautics industry, they cover aeronautics and which companies, you know, are shipping which new products and you know, which senior vice president of which company, you know, is moving over to which other company, they're doing sort of the day to day trade news. And that's a part of the ecosystem. And that happens with every industry, you know, from pharma to, um, you know, to tech to, um, to the oil and gas industry, you know, every industry has its trade reporters, and those are a piece of the ecosystem. And then you have sort of the, the, mainstream media, what we would call like the sort of national media or the sort of general interest media, whose job is really to sort of assess the state of the industry at, as a whole and to tell stories and to investigate, um, you know, claims of wrongdoing, um, to um, explain things that need explaining. Um, so a lot of what I spend my time doing these days is just explaining basic concepts um, to the readers of the New York Times, like what do we mean when we talk about uh, Web3 or an NFT or is uh, an NFT, proof yeah. of stake versus proof of work? Like, what is this stuff? Because um, I think that there still is a huge knowledge gap out there. Um, and so part of what I see my job is doing is just being the kind of translator between what are the people in crypto talking about and what does that mean to you, uh, a non-crypto person? Um, so I think journalists have all kinds of roles. Um, I think that we, you know, ideally we'd be doing all of it. We'd be doing the, you know, finding the stuff at the frontier, um, you know, talking about the the potential, um, but also looking into 
evidence of wrongdoing, sort of rooting out frauds and scams. Um, people forget like that's a really important part of kind of our our, our media is, is serving as kind of the immune system for um, for industry, for figuring out who's, you know, full of it and who's legit mm -hmm. and which companies have actual products and which don't. Um, and so that's a function of, of the media too, is sort of separating fact from fiction, wheat from chaff, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I think we can do all of that with crypto, just like we do with any other industry. And I, I, I should say, I don't think we are currently doing all of that. Like, I don't think the media's um, coverage of crypto has been perfect by any means. And um, so that's part of what I'm trying to, to do is to do better there. And I, I'm curious what you both think of sort of the mainstream coverage of crypto and, and what it gets right and maybe what we're not doing so well. Yeah, I mean, it's a, obviously a pet topic of mine. I mean, I suppose one of the things I found the most frustrating um, when I was at the journal and why I just decided to leave actually before I even joined Coindesk and went off to MIT, I, I um, yeah, I felt that just there was such a, at that point at least, a lack of understanding about what it was and what it represented in terms of this new paradigm for, you know, for, for keeping records and, and, and therefore was really unable to have a serious conversation that wasn't framed by this old way of thinking. And, and that, that took me took like a bit of a box. I think it's come a long way since. And I think, you know, yourself and so many other people in mainstream media are now starting to get it. However, I do think that like there's, concepts that i'd like to see introduced that are one of them actually is this distinction between the concept of, of public and private um it's interesting when you talk about money they talk about uh you know private money and public money and they lump decentralized cryptocurrency like bitcoin into the private money world and they talk about obviously government money as public money uh, and then they'll talk about facebook's you know libra coin as being private money as well I actually think that there is a possibility. I mean, this is again, a, a, an exercise that media needs to come to terms with that you could argue that a truly permissionless blockchain is the most public form. It is a public asset. If nobody can shut this down and that doesn't, that our role as journalists is still to protect that public good. Like we, we need to be challenging people who are trying to take over those systems and who are, you know, if there is, you know, whatever VC that's controlling this or that, that whole debate is a legitimate one for us to be doing but you're not holding elected officials to account. You're actually sort of holding the whole system to account. And in many respects, it is more public than anything else. And, and that I don't think has, has in any way introduced, been introduced into, into mainstream thinking. I think they see this as private and, and it's just, it's, it's somewhere, it's, it's just a different thing, whether it, it should be called public or anything else, it is not private and, and, and in the sense of it being controlled by a single centralized entity. And I'm really not sure that the public discourse has got the, the, the media discourse has got its head around that issue. That's one thing that I, that I really need to, I think needs to change. And I'm just not sure how we get there. Michael, what do you think? How do you think the New York Times should cover crypto? I think that there really should be, um, th 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 there needs to be a deeper understanding of the cutting edge ideas that are happening at the, at the forefront of crypto. So like, talking to folks who are building things like knowledge, zero knowledge proof solutions and what that actually means for how we might deal with things like privacy, the trade-off between privacy and the public interest, right? So the money laundering versus, um, you, know, uh, 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 you know, the open access that, that crypto goes is often treated in this sort of very simplistic way. It's like, well, we've got to catch the bad guys there, you know, and that's why we still have to have, you know, AML and, and KYC rules um without really sort of exploring that hang on there might actually be solutions out there that allow us through this technology to improve financial inclusion but at the same time explore uh ways to protect the public interest the financial system and so forth and technologies like zero knowledge proofs and a whole lot of other things could potentially go there and there's just not enough understanding of that it's just it's always still and it's not just to go off the new york times it's all mainstream media it's still this dichotomy of this or that crypto is good for this but it's bad for that similarly the energy debate energy debate is all about it's just way too much energy energy consumption with bitcoin and therefore bad and there's some truth to that it's clearly got a massive carbon footprint we've got a number of episodes on this show talking about this but there's a whole other way of thinking about it that starts to talk about, okay, what do we do? What could policymakers do to leverage the, and then we, actually there's going to be some hearings this week to talk about these things in Congress. But the, 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 the idea that there is 
another way of thinking about this, that you can flip this around and start to think about system design from a societal perspective and, how, and why this technology as an open source system and an easily freely accessible system really does change those systems. I don't think there's nearly enough understanding of systems, you know, exponential effects, network effects, all those things that are just fundamental to the, really the world we live in, but are really important to crypto. I don't think that level of understanding exists across enough mainstream media to be able to pass all this and understand it properly. Totally. I mean, I think one of the macro problems with crypto journalism uh, writ large, and this goes far beyond the New York Times and, and far beyond any individual outlet, but I think, you know, the, um, the objective uh, messengers are not credible and the credible messengers are not objective. <laughs> and so you have, um, you know, on one hand, the mainstream media, which is still writing for a mass audience where they might not, they might need some prerequisites before they jump into, you know, zero knowledge proofs and, and things like that. They, they need to take the 101 class maybe before they, they jump into the graduate seminar. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get there and we'll get more sophisticated, but I do think there is this issue where, you know, the people who are the most um, settled on the frontier are, are just hopelessly biased. I mean, cannot see for the life of them, the downside of any of this. And so um, I think that we need to, you know, I don't think it would be a, a good move, um, you know, if we shifted to writing only positive stories about crypto. And uh, I don't think that would be good for crypto. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think it'd be good for our readers. But I think we do need to, I'm, I'm curious, in particular, because I'm thinking about, well, where should I be aiming my coverage? Is it to the person who has no idea about any of this? Is it to the person who, you know, maybe owns a little bit of Bitcoin and a little Ethereum, but doesn't really understand the, the sort of second layer, um, you know, concepts? Is it, uh, you know, yeah. should I be doing some of all of it? Where do you aim your coverage if you're me? So I'm, I'm curious, do you, where do you think I should be aiming? Who, do, who is my audience? Yeah. Like, should I be aiming for, um, you know, the person out there who's never heard of any of this, or should I be assuming a level of fluency? Yeah. Well, I Tell me how to do my job, level, please. Yeah. I certainly wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't assume a level of fluency. I mean, that's for sure, because I think hardly anyone's really fluent in this stuff. And so I think, uh, and it's something that we, we talk about on the show all the time, right? Like, who's the audience? Who are we trying to reach? And it's something I think about in the role I have at the forum all the time. Like, is, is in my... I, I talk a lot about my role as I see it being really to uh, help normalize crypto as one among many options and mainstreaming it as someone else's job, but normalizing it, I do feel because I do think that uh, the, I think we've moved beyond the idea that crypto is for criminals. And if you use it, you're doing something shady or you're being crazy or whatever. I think we've moved beyond that as a society, but I, there are still risks that need to be talked about. And so I think, I think what's missing, I think across a lot of journalist, a lot of outlets, it's kind of the, the, a consistent broad frame. And what I think that frame is, is that we are in a moment. And I think that there's not enough discussion about the moment. There's a lot of like cryptos everywhere. Why is it everywhere? There's a reason for that. And we're in a moment where the technology to Michael's point does have the potential. I think I believe this truly. It does have the potential to create uh, to move beyond creating a digital replication of the current power structure we have in society. It, it can do that. Is it going to do that is a really open question. In my mind, it is not obvious that's the way it's going to go. And what's happening now in the next, I would argue, like certainly five years, but even like the next two to three years is going to determine whether the crypto ecosystem winds up just being a digital representation of everything that we think is flawed about the way the internet works today, the way the financial system works today, all of that. We're just baking it in yet again in another iteration, right? And the story goes on. Or is it going to be something, maybe it's not as radical as some people would want or as is potentially possible, but certainly there's an opportunity to do something that is far more about empowerment agency and true democracy. That is a point I think gets missed in all of the like energy consumption, therefore bad or criminals and ransomware, da, da, da. Like that's to me, that's like micro decisions, right? We're talking about systemic potential upheaval and change or an establishment order that is baking itself into the digital environment. And that to me is the story I wanna see more of. And if you think about that frame behind every piece that's written, right? Like what then does the energy debate mean? Like how does it affect energy companies? What does it mean for establishment players? That's not the same as having a conversation that's like Bitcoin, lots of energy, terrible for the environment, blah. Oh, greener options, proof of stake. Like, I mean, that's so, that's just not interesting in my mind. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's what I think is missing from a lot of the, of the pieces that I see. Totally. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons whenever people tell me like, why should I pay attention to 
crypto? Like, why do I care? I'm, I'm a normal person with a normal job. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a DGen. I'm not, you know, <laughs> right, right. I'm not an NFT flipper. Um, why should I care about this? Um, one of the things that I tell them is, you know, caring about this now, understanding it now is the best way to ensure that it doesn't become a destructive force later. Um, Future you proofing, know, if you will. What's that? Ah, exactly. Well, yeah. well, and I and I think about this in sort of autobiographical terms because I remember when social media was young. Um, I was starting out as a journalist, but I, I remember that most of the coverage sort of assumed that it wouldn't work. It was like social media, oh, you know, it's this fad. Um, people are going to get tired of seeing their friends, you know, brunch photos. That was a big thing. Like, why do I care about avo people's avocado toast? You know, people just assumed that all the, all the punditry was like, Facebook will never make money. Um, Twitter will never make money. These companies will fail. Um, and that was sort of the dominant knock on them for a long time. And what no one was asking, or at least not like people loudly in positions of authority was like, what if this works super well? What if it totally yes. it goes to 11, right? The like world. It's, 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 what if billions of people yeah. get on board? What if it elects presidents? What if it changes the way politics is done? What if it changes, you know, in, introduces thorny questions around free speech and safety and privacy and offline violence and misinformation? And like, I, yep. I just think that we need a strain of crypto coverage in the mainstream media that that doesn't assume that it won't work, but takes possible takes seriously the possibility yes. that it will. Right. Yeah. It's very it's very quick right now to just dismiss and to see the problems as a reason to assume that it isn't going to work. And in fact, it it, it it those two things can be quite separate, right? So yeah, and I, like I really take your point about like you know th there is a risk, of, there is a problem with credibility of sources. I think that's particularly acute in um, what I see as crypto tribalism. Uh, you know, there's these token tribes and they're all obsessed with their token. And if you're not writing about them, you've obviously got some hidden agenda. And that's extremely hard to take them seriously because it's just such a, such a narrow vested interest take on this. And token holders who are listening to me, you know who I'm talking about. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just one of those, it, it makes it very difficult to take sometimes the whole industry seriously. But I will posit that there is, this has always been so, right? There are always vested interests who are trying to distort the truth. And there's very much the case that those who want to see this industry fail also have a lot of skin in the game, right? And you know, Wall Street is is the quintessential uh, example of that. So, yeah, it, it's 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 tough. It, it's like where do you find credible sources who aren't just dismissive, who aren't haven't got some stake in the game, who aren't just cheerleaders either, but can look at this um, from that very big picture perspective and say, you know. Where's it going? Why does it matter? What are the risks and, and so forth? And I mean, that's, they're the most interesting questions. Uh, the questions that we will continue to ask and pursue here on Money Reimagined as we have. Um, so thank you very much, Kevin, for engaging what I think has been more of a, a classic three-way conversation. And I've really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, lots to think about, lots to talk about. Um, congratulations on, on, uh, on the books, on, on, on everything you've been doing in, in this space. It's uh, looking forward to seeing where it goes. So. Again, thanks very much for, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Sheila, as always. And thank you to all of you for listening. Come back again next week for another episode of Money Reimagined.